In case you didn't know, I'm a massive fan of Victor Hugo. Now, I first saw the musical version of his story in 2012 when the movie came out. Then I got to know the musical. And then in 2013, I read the actual brick itself. It is immense. And this is going to sound pissy, but it spoke to me in a way that no book had ever spoken to me before. So when I was in Paris in 2014, I wanted to see Victor Hugo's Paris. As an English speaker, there wasn't a lot of tours going around. So I had to improvise and I made my own tour. I went to the Pantheon to see his tomb. I went to the Luxembourg Gardens uh, to see where Marie and Cosette fell in love. And I went to his apartment where he lived in for a period of his life, which is now being turned into a museum. When I left the museum, the concierge said to me, thank you very much for coming. And I was like, no, thank you for having me. Victor Hugo was born in February in 1802 to Sophie Trebuchet and General Joseph Leopold Hugo. As a child, following his soldier father, he witnessed some interesting political changes in France, which included the First French Republic and the dictatorship under Napoleon Bonaparte. His father was an enthusiastic supporter of the Atheist Republic regime, whilst his mother was a Catholic royalist. Following opposing political values, Victor's parents split up the boys went and followed Sophia in Paris where they got their education. As a young man he fell in love with Adèle Fouchier. In 1821 he married his childhood sweetheart. Though it was later remarked that their love was a false young love, their marriage fell apart when Adèle became involved with the critic Saint Bevue. Victor, heartbroken, moved on to his mistress, the actress Juliette Druitt. Although he would stray in later years, he would always return to her and their union lasted over 50 years. To English speakers, Hugo is most well known for his novels, but to the French he's probably more well known as a poet. At a young age, Victor began to publish volumes of poetry, becoming a prominent figure in the Romantic literature movement. In 1831, The Hunchback of Notre Dame was released. It was very successful and was translated to a number of languages, and it actually revitalised the Notre Dame. People started to take an interest in it, tourism, and they started to care for the building. Hugo was becoming increasingly involved in politics, and in 1841, he was elected into the Académie Française. He became a strong supporter of the Republic form of government, and he voiced his opinions about this. Hugo publicly opposed the death penalty, social injustice, and he advocated the freedom of the press. At the 1848 formation of the Second Republic, Hugo was appointed to the Legislative Assembly. Louis Napoleon, or Napoleon III, seized power in 1851 and established an anti-parliamentary constitution in the country. Hugo began to attack him openly and he was consequently exiled for 19 years. During his political exile, he lived mostly in Jersey, a British island on the English Channel. And this is where he would finish writing his masterpiece, Les Miserables. The six-part book was a mix of politics, French history and the stories of the suffering of humanity. During his exile, he telegrammed his British publishers to ask them what they thought of the book and he just telegrammed them a simple question mark. And of course, I'm assuming because of the sheer complexity of the book, they replied with a single exclamation mark. It's also said that Charles Dickens was greatly inspired by Hugo's work. Hugo returned to France when the Napoleon dynasty was overthrown and the Third Republic was established in 1859. He continued to be heavily involved with French politics. He's also an artist. You can look up some of his pieces, which I will put on for your eyes right now. He died in 1885 at the age of 83 and he was widely mourned across the country. Some of my favourite quotes that I've found. When dictatorship is a fact, revolution becomes a right. He who opens a school door closes a prison. To love another person is to see the face of God. And this one's a bit of a doozy but it's quite good. Have no fear of robbers and murderers. They are external dangers. Petty dangers. We should fear ourselves. Prejudices are real robbers. Vices, the real murderers. And the great dangers are within us. Why worry about what threatens our heads and purses? Let us think about what threatens our souls. 